Congo. So these are the rules that I've been really obsessed with for the last couple of weeks to the exclusion of all my other wargaming projects. So all the things I had on my desk have been put to one side and I've gone berserk over these rules. They are just fantastic. Um, they're the latest set of rules from Studio Tomahawk who already have a, an excellent pedigree. Um, they have produced Saga, Muskets and Tomahawks and Jugular before this set of rules and um, I'm a massive fan of Saga I, I enjoy playing Muskets and Tomahawks when I play it, but I'm not into the period. And I've recently also started playing Jugular, and I enjoy that. Um, but I can honestly say that what I've seen so far of these rules, they are far and away the best thing to come out of Studio Tomahawks ever. Um, just incredible. Um, so there are a set of rules set in the period of African exploration, so the mid to late 19th century. Um, absolutely fantastic layout and presentation of the rules. The, this book is just a joy to look at and the rules themselves, I've had a read through once, um, very kind of exciting. You can tell um, the, the, the main player at Studio Tom Hawks is a guy called Alex Bouchel. And you can see his, um, you can see his kind of handwriting, if you like, his style in all the rules that come out of Studio Tom Hawks. So, there are kind of features that you can identify in this set of rules that um, you would recognise in other sets of rules, but um, to kind of, it would be a mistake to kind of think it's something like Saga set in Africa. It's nothing like that at all. Just look at these pictures. They just they have they have sort of double page photographs in here as well. I mean, and this. This, uh, admittedly, some rules that could be the eye candy that distracts you from flaws in the text, but this the, the text matches the quality of the pictures. I can assure you, it's just amazing. Um, so, with the rules, you get you get the rules themselves, um, and it's a kind of odd mix of mechanisms. It's a card-driven game, so you get a stack of cards. Um, unlike Jugular, where you need one stack of cards per player, um, this is a two-player game. So you get two different card colouring backings there. So the one deck of cards is enough for the game. You don't need to get any extra cards. And as far as I can tell, there is nothing in here to allow you to play with more than two players. So unlike Saga... You can't go up to four players. Um, but I was thinking about this, and I don't see... If you were to buy yourself another set of cards, I don't think they're sold separately from the rule set. Um, but if I don't think it would be impossible to play with four players. I don't know. Um, so you have, you have two sets of cards in here, um, and each player's cards are divided into two types. So you have seven cards that are what are known as action cards. Just look at the, the sort of clever, ca um, characterful descriptions on these cards. And each turn, you have seven cards there. That's a separate card. I forget that what that is. Um, forgive me. You have to forgive me. I forget what that is. Um, each turn, you pick three of the seven cards. So these are kind of always face up. They're always available for for the player to view, and you deliberately choose three particular cards out of these seven. 
And then the turn is divided into action steps. So there are three action steps. And for each action step, you play one of these cards. And what they allow you to do is that one there, for instance, is a movement. So it allows you to move two groups. Um, not sure what that symbol is. I think it might be melee. Not sure. So that card there would allow you to melee, possibly. No, forget that. I have to reread the rules. It's not melee, but it's something else. Um, that one there, for instance, allows you to move with one group and shoot with a group. Doesn't have to be the same group. Um, and then the other cards are all face down, so you shuffle these so they're randomised. But these are totem cards, and the totems allow you to add extra die rolls. Um, to shooting actions, melee actions, that kind of thing, or extra movement distances. So you keep them in your hand and you play them. These ones allow you to make one extra action than, the, than what is on the card that you've got there. Um, so you keep them in your hand and you play them when appropriate. Um, just before I forget though, what I want to really emphasises the quality of the, of, the, of the design and layout of this game. So there are scenarios, but you won't find them at the back of the book. Um, and the reason for that is that they've done something really clever, which is to print the scenarios out on separate sheets. Um, there are eight there are four sheets, and there's a scenario on each side. So there's a scenario, there are eight scenarios. And they're all printed out to look as though they were on a sort of 19th century newspaper bulletin um, from the Society Géographique. So I don't know if that is actually a historical um, French society, but it's obviously the equivalent of the Royal Geographical Society in Britain. And you have all the details on, on here that you need, the layout of the table, um, the protagonist, the the objectives, uh, everything, all the all the different things, together with a little story that kind of puts it into a kind of African exploratory context. Uh, and every one of these is is different. Um, they're all numbered, so this is number three, number four, and um, as the numbers go up, it's supposed to get slightly more difficult so it's probably best to begin with the lower numbers but I just think that is absolutely uh, the bee's knees it really does immerse you in the in the feel of the game it gives a really it's a really brilliant way of beginning the game's narrative um, and on top of that I, I've already told you and shown you that the 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 book is full of interesting illustrations and photos, but look at the extreme level of care that they've gone into um, producing this book. Somewhere in here, I should have made a note of the page number before I began this. There, that, that one there. I don't know if I can bring that closer. This is a really lovely photo of some figures um, on a steamship going down the Congo, presumably, or an African river. If I can get closer there. The characters, they've got a desk on board, and they've miniaturised the newspapers, so the scenarios. You see that probably? And the, and the rule book. That's a little miniature version of this rule book um, which they produced and put into the photo it's it's just intricate in the in the care and attention that they've paid to to the presentation of this book um, right so as well as the cards you also play with tokens um, so all these tokens you break out these ones as well and you put them into a bag and you draw them from the bag when certain circumstances arrive, arise. So, um, for
for instance, if you make um, a hasty move or you have a, have a you fight in a melee and things like that, you draw one of these tokens at random, and you can only have a maximum of four tokens in in your hand at any one time. But each one will reduce the effectiveness of a particular action. So, for instance, these reduce the effectiveness of your movement, these of your fighting, these of your shooting. Um, and the more you collected one type, the more that particular type of action will deteriorate, um, which is a nice, clever idea as well. And these red ones here with the palm prints, these are panic tokens, which are in with the stress tokens. And if you draw one of those, then it really scuppers you for the turn. Um, but at the end of the turn, you put it back in the bag. These ones you can you get rid of in a kind of similar way to um, restoring your morale. There's actions that can do that. Um, you might have noticed that there are movement sticks in here. Um, so players of Saga will be familiar with this kind of mechanism. Um, there are only three different lengths though, not four. In Saga you have long, medium short and very short. In this game you have long, medium and two shorts. And um, the two shorts are used. A normal move is, is short, but you can make an action, it's called step out, where you can add that one to that one. So you can make a sort of curved move and, and a hastier move. Um, so that's a nice little alteration to the side rules. Um, and another thing that's interesting is that these um, movement sticks are of a, of a particular 25mm width. And the reason for that is, in some circumstances, when you're looking at line of sight or shooting, um, this stick has to be able to cover the base entirely. And what that means is that, unlike in Saga, the base sizing is important and you have, you're obliged to put the figures onto a 25mm base. Anything smaller and it would be much easier for the um, stick to cover them and anything larger and it would be impossible for the stick to cover them. So it would be an illegal base size. So 25mm rounded bases for all the figures in your, in your faction. Give you a look at another page while I put you on. Um, right, you don't have um, Saga dice, there's no specific dice, um, but you are rolling a, a multiplicity of dice, it's only thing from a D6 up to a D10, so you play with D6s, D8s and D10s. Uh, when you're moving the groups around they have to remain completely in base to base contact rather than two inches apart and the terrain works differently as well there are really interesting rules for terrain um, in that you um, you have blocking terrain and you have low terrain and you have something which is called dangerous terrain um, now the dangerous terrain is um, it doesn't slow down your movement, but the minute your group moves into it, if there's not another group in there and you haven't scouted the terrain, then you roll to see if an incident occurs. And it could be, um, you roll on, depending on whether you're playing in savannah or in jungle, you have this dangerous terrain table and you roll and say, for instance, if you roll... Um, that one there, you awake a panther hidden in the bushes, the animal attacks your men, resolve a shooting action against this group, and so on. Uh, the zone is full of venomous plants, and their contact is extremely irritating. A python tries to stifle your men. It's all kind of things like that. And in the savannah, um, the heat begins to be overwhelming. You are attacked by baboons living here, that kind of thing. Um... On top of that, I don't know if you noticed, but uh, some of the scenarios actually involve placing wild animals on the table. So you do need to have prepared um, 
gorillas and lions and that kind of thing. That one there, um, I think in this one, in this particular one, you're actually attempting to capture the gorilla. Uh, right, what else? Um, there are four different types of, I don't know what you'd call them, in, in Saga you'd call them factions. I think they're called columns in this game. Another brilliant picture there. Um, so you have the white men expeditions. You have Sultanates of Zanzibar. The forest tribes. And the African kingdoms. And for each column, um, you make up a you make up a, for each faction you make up a column and you get for free two characters so you can you pick from one of these one what's that one six characters so for the forest tribes um, there's a chieftain talking drums the champion the pygmy king the healer and the witch doctor you're not allowed two of the same type and you're not allowed more than two but each character will lend a different um, attribute to a group that he will join in your column. So you get those for free, but they are starred differently. So you notice this one here, Talking Drums, has only got one star, the Chieftain's got three, the others have got two. Um, and that will determine who has the initiative in the first turn. Um, you also get auxiliaries, which you can add um, to the column, and they they that starts to cost you points. So, the native factions, the forest tribes and the um, kingdoms of Africa, have sacred warriors. The other two groups, the white men's expeditions and the sultanate of Zanzibar, have uh, bearers that allow them to move more easily. Um, and they cost you points, so you're beginning to stack up points when you put those into your column. And then you also then choose from, what's this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different types of warrior or character. Um, so that is completely unlike Saga, where you've only got the three uh, warrior types. You've got Hearthguard, Warrior and Levy. In this you can pick from the, a large menu of different uh, troop types and each troop type will be rolling different dice um, types uh, for different types of attributes. So the young warriors roll d8s in combat but d6 in bravery and d6 in shooting. Bravery is a kind of morale type attribute um, and each group is also a different size in terms of the number of figures so cannibals warriors and young warriors will five figures as are the bundukis which are musket armed uh, figures but the hunters are only four the archers are six the scouts are three and so on um, so these will each cost you each group will cost you a number of points um, there's a limit on the number of groups that you can have sometimes can't find where that is but it will tell you sometimes that you're only allowed to have um, one or two of a particular group in your column uh, can't see where it is but that does that does apply and um, I think what I'll do next, that's, that's more or less a very, very quick and uh, garbled introduction to the rules. I'll show you um, the first set of figures that I've painted up. Right, yeah, maybe at this point I'll talk to you a little bit about um, the figures themselves. All the figures in this book are from Wargames Foundry. And Wargames Foundry have been defined. This is a lovely picture here. This is 
it must be teddy bear fur, I think. It's a really clever idea. So what they've done is run a, some kind of clippers or shaver over certain areas and coloured it differently. It, it looks like spectacular savannah. Anyway, Wargames Foundry have been defined as the official supplier of figures for the Congo rules. Um, and what they've done is Studio Tomahawk have selected from their very extensive Darkest Africa range and made up for each of the four factions have made up a column. Now, I'm a big fan of Foundry as well as I am of Studio Tomahawks and I have absolutely no problem with that whatsoever. If, I, if, if they hadn't had an official supplier of figures, I would have gone to Foundry for my needs anyway. But what is really strange at the moment is that um, the columns that they've made up, so this is a, this is a photograph of the, of the official 70 point box set from Wargames Foundry of the Forest Tribes. And this is the one that I've painted up at the moment. So I'll show you the paint job I've done on, on the figures in a moment. Um, but as I said earlier, you can, you can make up your column in a lot of different ways. There's a lot of different permutations. And if you wanted to alter this in any way, at the moment, as far as I can see, there aren't any separate blister packs to allow you, for instance, to add um, a unit of pygmy warriors. What you get with the box set is a unit of pygmy archers, these, these guys here. There are no pygmy warriors in this column. So in order to get five figures from the pig, for, to, to make up a unit of pygmy warriors, I would have to buy, I think it's six figures, um, because Foundry don't sell figures individually. They sell them in groups. Um, another good example is um, that, you, as I said, you can only have two of these characters in your, in your um, column, and they have selected for you the chieftain, this guy here, and the witch doctor, this guy here. But what if I wanted to put the pygmy king in, in there? He comes in a group of, um, I think they're leaders or something like that, um, but there are six of them in the group, and a lot of them aren't of any, well, I suppose they are of use in the rules, but you need to buy six um, leaders in order to acquire one pygmy king. Um, this guy here, the healer, he comes in a, in a group of witch doctors, which includes this guy here, um, but also includes a lot of other witch doctors. Um, the African kingdoms have got this witch doctor here with, um, with the venomous snake in his hand, but there are three other witch doctors as well. Um, so what I'm trying to say is, it's quite hard to kind of... At the moment, I'm sure things will change as, as the game gets going, um, it's quite hard to, to supplement your column once you've got the basic 70 points, because 70 points is the minimum. It's a bit like uh, the four-point box sets that, they, that um, Gripping Beasts have for Saga. Four points is a sort of small game, um, and you're going to need more to play Saga. And you could play a game with 70 points of this, but... It, the, the scenarios are all, all suggest columns of between 70 and 100. Um, and as I say, as I just said, made the remark before, as the game gets going, but the thing that absolutely does stagger me about these rules, or the way they've been um, announced, is that there's been nothing um, in... On, there's an official Studio Tomahawks forum... And for a long time, there's been the odd thread saying, what's happening to the rules? When are they coming out? There's been no, no official um, announcement that the rules are out now. Someone just published on the forum um, a link to the War Games Foundry site showing that they had um, released the rules and had put together the box sets. But nothing, not a... Not a whisper from Studio Tom Hawks themselves and there's also the, the, the official forum is broken into sections that include Saga, Jugular and Muskets and Tomahawks. There's nothing in there to suggest that they're going to add a section for, for the Congo rules and 
it is it is necessary. It is nice to have a forum where you can discuss rules and post up your pictures. But the, the Studio Tom Hawks official forum also includes a section once you're registered you have access to something called the Armoury where you can download uh, quick reference sheets and, and tokens and um, special rules for special characters, all that kind of thing. Um, so they are going to have to do something about that. And I do wonder what's going on. Um, and the reason I say that is that is there any kind of political element to this in terms of the relationships between Studio Tomahawk and Gripping Beast and War Games Foundry in that Gripping Beast do have quite a large presence on the official Studio Tomahawk's um, forum and are there, is, there, is there a problem with War Games Foundry also having a similar access to the forum I don't know, I'm only speculating, but it does seem odd to me that Gripping Beast market figures produced by North Star um, for Musket and Tomahawks, but they're clearly not going to be able to do the same thing for the figures from War Games Foundry. So there's a little bit of a splintering of, um, of the factions, if you, were, if you will, um, I don't know, maybe I'm just second guessing what's going on and it'll all settle down but, but to reiterate, these are far and away the best thing ever to have come out of Studio Tomahawks and they should be broadcasting it from the rooftops um, it's come out with a very um, low profile uh, start and it deserves way way more um, and another another kind of semi-political issue is that War Games Foundry are producing box sets but you can also buy these rules from North Star and across the Atlantic in, in the US you can buy them from Brigade Games and both Brigade Games and North Star have their own range of figures for Darkest Africa and they have made up um, their own box sets so that you can make up the figures that you need from their, from their ranges. So in a way, what is the point of having an official supplier to the walls? I don't understand. Unless War Games Foundry are going to change the way that they produce their walls, then um, it seems to me there's no point in them actually being the official supplier, unless they're going to change the way they, they produce their figures, I mean break them up into separate blisters and all that kind of thing. Um, because what they've done at the moment is they've taken a lot of these... This, this is an old uh, catalogue from War Games Foundry that includes the... It's the Victoria Rana range, but it includes their Darkest Africa um, figures. Uh, to give you an idea of what they've done, they've simply renamed a lot of their... Uh, figures. So this guy here, the reporter, is actually the figure that used to represent uh, Richard Francis Burton, the explorer. Um, let see if I can find him in here. There he is, that guy there. Captain Sir Richard Francis Burton. So he was one of the pair, Burton and Speak, who searched for the source of the Nile. Um, but in here, he's suddenly been transformed into a reporter. Um, lots of cases of that. There are a lot of these um, uh, a lot of these adventurers um, were all named adventurers in the in the original range, and now they've simply been transformed into um, adventurers, generic adventurers, which is fine. You can, you can do that. But what I'm trying to say is that they're, they're going to have to rejig their entire range. And they have gone through so many different iterations in the past War Games Foundry with cobblestone figures coming and going and breaking off onto separate websites and things. That it's going to be quite a difficult logistical exercise for them, I would have thought. 
Um, but, that, but that's not to detract from these rules or the figures, indeed, because both are pre premium products. Anyway, right, now I want to show you what I've done in terms of painting so far. Right, so first up, these are my Forest Tribes figures. It's the box set from War Games Foundry, 70 points. Um, I bought everything that I could, went a little bit mad, and um, War Games Foundry do a box set for each faction. And they also do a fifth box set, which is all the additional figures and so on that you'll need for any of the scenarios. So they do a gorilla, um, it's either one or two lions, a couple of crocodiles, bearers, hostages, special characters such as missionaries that turn up in some of the scenarios. Um, so I got those as well. And as I say, I went a little bit overboard and... Um, I was intending to go to Colours in September um, and interestingly War Games Foundry are putting on a demo game of Con Congo at Colours if you go um, but that kind of reinforces my point about Gripping Beast because up until now all the Studio Tomahawk games have always been on show and uh, have little demo games around the Gripping Beast stall um, so Congo seems to have gone in a different direction, which kind of, you know, reinforces that point I was making about the, the official forum. It's wondering what's going on. Um, but anyway, this, these are the forest tribes. So what you get in the box set are a chieftain and a witch doctor. Um, you get three scouts who are these guys here. Now, um, these chaps are taken from War Games Foundry's Warriors with Sculpted Hair um, collection, which is about six figures. And um, normally they would come with a shield, but um, so they, they, they do kind of almost look as though they're inviting having a shield stuck onto them um, but you don't get one in the box set oh and another thing you don't get while I remember is you don't get any of the Renedra bases unlike the Gripping Beast box sets so you have to source your own 25mm rounded bases um, so and as I say with the rules you do require 25mm rounded bases um, it's not up to you to Put them on anything larger or smaller um, but usually war games foundry don't sell their figures along with spears the spears are sold separately and you do get the spears in the box set um, whether they were trying to keep the cost to a minimum left things like the bases out i don't know um, right so you've got three scouts you have five warriors which I've painted up in a similar way to the picture photographs in the rule book, except that they come with a kind of wicker shield rectangular shape, um, which is, a, I would have preferred one of the oval shapes that they've got in the, in the book, actually. I, I, um, I painted, they're a little bit difficult to paint up with any kind of variety, these shields, because they have um, horizontal segmentation which means that you're kind of obliged to paint stripes on them really if you paint them at all um, the, the the forest tribes didn't have access to a lot of um, hide and so on so they tended to make their shields from wicker um, but they were a variety of shapes and and so on and they would either keep them plain or color them usually black um, but i've gone for sort of red white and black and uh, also, I don't know if you can see, but I've tried to put a little bit of white, white sort of body paint on them as well, make them look a little bit more senior to these other guys here, who are just warriors. Uh, sorry, junior warriors, I think they're called. Young warriors, young warriors. Show you those next. 
So these are the young warriors. I actually prefer these shields. Um, they're closer to what I've seen in books and so on. Um, and they, it gives you a little bit more scope about how you paint patterns on them and such. Um, so I think you can basically let your imagination rip a little bit. Um, right, so they're young warriors. Then you've got a, use, a unit of, uh, what are they called, bundukis, which are five figures with muskets. Um, apparently muskets were preferred over rifles, as they were easier to maintain in the sort of humid conditions. So get six archers. So that's the archers. And uh, These next guys I'm going to show you are the pygmy archers and these are going to be quite fun to play with. Um, you buy them as a group of six points wise on the table but you have to break them into two units of three and then when you activate one the other unit might be somewhere else on the table but it can activate for free at the same time and they have a shorter range but poisoned arrows so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in the wars. So they're the Pygmy Archers. So that is the Forest Tribes, which is the first faction that I've painted up. But I do have, so I'm, at the moment I'm painting up the White Men's Expeditions, but I do have um, some other figures already in my collection that I can use. So I'm going to show you those next. Right, now these are some figures that I've had quite a long time. Um, I had them on square plastic bases and I just rebased them um, for the rules now. So these are, these are going to come in handy. Um, these are all from War Games Foundry, um, explorers and adventurers, and a lot of them have now been um, selected by Studio Tomahawk um, to go into War Games Foundry's box sets for Congo, but any of them will do. Um, and as I say, some of them have been renamed. So this is my version of um, Sir Richard Francis Burton, who is now the reporter in uh, Congo. And uh, I think, if I remember rightly, this guy here, yeah, this was John Henning Speak, who was uh, Burton's companion on their first expedition to search for the source of the Nile. Uh, but, you know, the, there's no reason why you can't use him as a generic adventurer. And I believe you're allowed to have two groups of three adventurers in the... Um, white men's expedition column, so that will allow me to use six of these figures. This chap here is the one who is actually used as the explorer, so he is the sort of leader of the white men's expedition. So that is a seventh figure that I'll be able to use. Um, a lot of them, this guy here is one, another one that's been selected, but he was originally called Capitan Crapaud, I think. Sort of given him a sort of French sounding name in the original rules, in the original range, um, but they're all perfectly fine to uh, to use. So um, it's given me a bit of a head start, and it was also if I paint up, which I am doing at the moment, the White Men's Expedition column, that would be seventy points, and then these guys will be additional points, so I'll have a larger larger war band. Um, so I'm quite chuffed about that. One of, uh, one of the things that I, I, I differ from a lot of war gamers, well, I don't differ in that I buy a lot and I have a huge lead mountain, but I never, ever get rid of things. 
because it always comes around again and you can use the figures. So I've had these about 20 years. If you get things when you can afford them, is my motto, because I certainly couldn't afford to buy a lot of stuff nowadays, and keep them. And at some stage or another, they might well come in handy. Um, so I'm quite pleased that I've, I've had these all, this, all these years. I originally bought them for a game... Um, there was a game called Bogotan, which was uh, a game where you went searching for dinosaurs in a kind of uh, lost world kind of setting. Um, so I had them as the hunters in that. Um, but as I say, they're straight out of Darkest Africa's, the uh, War Games Foundry's Darkest Africa range. So they'll be perfect for this new set of rules. And then next thing I want to show you is on a similar theme. So this is a little um, Victorian river steamer, which I bought at the same time as the Bogotan, as the figures I had for the rules Bogotan. And um, Bogotan was sold by a company called the Honourable Lead Boiler Suit Company, which is a bit of a mouthful. They're still around. Um, but they don't produce this steamer anymore, which is a bit of a pity. They've got some um, uh, river boats, which are kind of more heavily armed things um, and really suitable for a slightly later period, the sort of Edwardian period going up to the First World War. Um, but this, this they had for the rules, Bogotan, because you basically had to travel from island to island, searching, hunting for dinosaurs. Um, and, and I got this at the time and never got around to assembling it, putting it, painting it or anything like that, playing with it. But it's ideal now. I don't, I don't think there are any um, scenarios as such in the rules of Congo to use boats, but um, it'll make a nice little scenic effect and maybe I'll be able to invent a scenario. It doesn't hold many figures, in fact you can only really get one figure in there, um, the rest of them be a little bit clumsily placed that you could put them onto things like that. So it won't hold many figures but um, it's, it's the correct period. Um, I'll try to make it look a little bit um, down in the dumps, rusting kind of engines and boilers and so on, and a bit muddy on the on the hull. Um, it's a sort of African Queen type type boat, but uh, I'm really getting into the African <laughs> uh, theme at the moment. So I could remember having it, so I dug it out of the cupboard and painted it up. Right, so there we go, that's everything I've got to date. Um, I'll show you when I've finished uh, painting my next batch of figures and hopefully I'll get to play a game of this thing because um, I am absolutely engrossed by it. Um, it's become an absolute obsession with me and what a fantastic set of rules and product that Studio Tomahawk have come up with this time. So keep an eye out for it at War Game Shows and uh, if you go to Colours, you can check out the uh, check out the game there on the War Games Foundry stand. Unfortunately, I'm not going to go because I've spent all my money, all the train fare and the entrance fee, and what I would have spent on products at the show. I've now spent on on all these figures, so um, I'm going to stay at home and carry on painting. Anyway, see you on the next video. Bye for now.